Radio TV Phono Nut here, and this is one from the uh, Not What It Appears To Be file. When I saw this record player, I noticed I noticed no speaker grill anywhere on it. All I saw were these two pin jacks, old style headphone pin jacks, and of course these two knobs. So I said, well, this is probably either a phono attachment that's designed to connect to an external amplifier, or it's designed to drive a pair of headphones. So I put in a minimum bid and got it, and the shipping was cheap, so, you know, it didn't cost me a whole lot. Well, when I got here and looked at it, I noticed we have a power switch here that's for the motor. And then we have this control here, which is the master power and the volume control. But, you know, that could still be a level control for attenuating the signal going to an external amp or headphones. Uh, the tone arm has a lamp under it for illuminating the record surface. And this crystal cartridge, let's see if we can get the number on it here. L26A, date stamped August 1940. Well, I opened this up and I was wrong about what I thought it was. This is actually a wireless record player, meaning that this record player contains a small, low-powered AM transmitter. And the antenna consists of just a piece of wire stapled to the back of the cabinet. And its purpose was to to be able to set the record player close to an AM radio and broadcast your record to the radio. Now these were especially popular in the, oh, from about the late 30s through the late 40s, maybe early 50s. Well, probably late 40s. I think by the early 50s these had pretty much been phased out except for some stuff that maybe Allied Radio sold is in kit form, but these were mainly designed to add phonograph capability to radios that didn't have a built-in record player and didn't have an audio input jack to connect a record player. Now this line core is one of those resistance cords, meaning that it has a resistance element inside of the power cord to drop the excess voltage for the tubes, and then there's a tap for the... the uh, tone arm light. Now this cord appears to be nice and flexible, but we don't know what kind of shape the insulation is under this cloth covering, so we'll want to look at that before we go too much further. But right now I'm going to plug it up and see what happens. I have my little pocket radio, and we're going to see if we can tune in a signal. At best, I figure I will get is some... Uh, 60 cycle hum being picked up by the radio. Alright, we're plugged into the isolated power supply. I feel like this is a hot chassis job. Well, we don't need the motor on. Alright. We'll leave the motor off for now. And then we'll turn our radio on and tune through the band and see if we get any kind of a uh, modulation. Expansion this year as the virus... Is that something right there? Let's turn the... cut the power and see. Okay, maybe not. Could that be it? Yep, I believe that's it. And just as I suspected, we're getting a hum from a bad filter cap. I'm sure this cartridge is dead, but we're going to slap a record on it and see if any audio gets through. Okay, we have the modulation control wide open. Let's see what happens. Mm, 
Well, we're getting more needle talk than anything else, but I do hear a little something through the radio speaker. All right, let's replace that filter capacitor. Okay, this is a hot chassis death trap. And this filter capacitor has two grounds on it. Uh, I don't see any value on here unless it's under this strap. All I see is black and 150 working volts, but it's no big deal. It's not that critical. As far as Dynavox, I'm not that familiar with the company. This is the oldest product I've ever, I've ever seen with that brand on it. All I can tell you is everything I've seen by them was relatively cheap made and they were around, or at least the brand name was around at least through the 1970s because I've seen the brand on some cheapo solid state kitty phonographs. Okay, that was indeed the case. The values were hidden under the clamp. Alright, this is a dual 25 at 150 volts, so we could go with a couple of 33s. We'll do just fine there. Okay, some pretty sloppy manufacturing here, and that's not uncommon for these lower end companies from back then. Instead of attaching the filter capacitor leads to the respective terminal down here, I just tacked them onto this resistor here, but we're going to clean this up and make it look a little better. Okay, there are the filters tacked in. Now before I go any further, I just want to fire it up and see where we stand at this point. All right, let's turn it on. When the motor is off, I'll activate that in a minute. And when it warms up, let's just see if I... Yep, there it is. So we have a carrier. I don't believe this, but that crystal cartridge appears to be working just fine. Turn this down a bit. With that needle talk, you really don't need any kind of external amplification. <laughs> now, I don't expect uh, ultimate sound quality out of this. These never. Okay, as I was trying to say before the uh, camera ran out of memory, I don't expect high fidelity out of something like this. They didn't sound, well, some sounded better than others, but most of them didn't sound all that great when they were brand new. There's really no substitute for a direct connection to your amplifier, whether it be a wired phono attachment or a phonograph that's built into your radio, but still, these ones like this are still interesting and fun to play around with. That sound you hear is the continuity beeper in my meter. And as you can see, we have it connected between the cartridge slash tone arm and the power plug. And there is a direct connection there. So yeah, this is indeed a death trap. Now with that said, this is obviously an oddball piece in the way it's designed. And I'm debating on whether to leave the design the way it is or alter this where it'll be a bit safer. 
if this was something that I was planning on releasing to somebody or one I was fixing for someone, it would be modified for safety, but since I'm the only one that's going to be using it, and that's not going to be very frequent, I may just leave it alone to protect the integrity of the design here. But this is definitely one that if I, if part of your body was in contact with something with a path to ground, as in you're standing on a concrete floor barefoot and or whatever, or your part of your body is touching an old metal cabinet that's has a path to ground or whatever. There's any number of scenarios that could provide a path to ground, and you reach and grab this tone arm. Uh, you could very well not be listening to any more records on this earth, and we'll just leave it at that. Okay, these pin jacks are connected across the cartridge, so you could connect the output of the cartridge to another amplifier, or you could plug something else, an external audio source, into this and use this transmitter to broadcast it. Although with the current hot chassis situation, I would not recommend connecting any sort of uh, external equipment to this. It's just a recipe for disaster. Okay, we have three paper capacitors that need to go. This big silver one is connected across the AC power line. And its purpose is for RF suppression. And those tend to short and blow up, so we want to get rid of that. Uh, this one here that's connected between a terminal of our oscillator and modulator tube to ground, it looks like probably a cathode bypass. And this other one down here looks like a screen grid bypass. Again, those are to keep RF off of those respective tube elements. So we'll need to get rid of those too check over the resistors and replace any of those that are severely out of whack and then that should take care of the transmitter chassis and then of course we'll need to take this drive mechanism and motor apart and clean and lubricate it well I thought we were going to have some telemarketer action there but it turns out it was the preacher calling and I answered the phone kind of a, with an abrupt uh, hello, so I had to uh, I had to apologize for that. So, so yeah, not all of the out of area calls are bogus. Some of them are actually legit, and I'm going to have to learn to answer the phone more pleasant like. And then once I determine it's a telemarketer, then I can pull my usual routine on them. Okay, every cap and every resistor was way out of tolerance in this thing, and all that's been replaced now. And it sounds a little better. suppose now all we have to do is clean and lubricate the mechanism and this thing will be ready to roll. And the name of that record for anyone that's interested, often I'm, often people will ask me what was the name of that record you played. This is Arms for the Love of America by the DECA band with the American Four. And then the other side is, what's the other side? Any bonds today? Obviously a World War II era record. Oh yes, and this half used pack of needles was in there. Wall cane, 50 needles, 15 cents. These are kind of copper colored. Guaranteed to play 10 records on any phonograph. Extra loud. And then there's a bunch of these needles in the little needle cup there. I presume they're new. 
But yeah, this is one of those types of cartridges that technically you're supposed to ch use steel needles and change it after each record. Uh, you probably could use a sapphire needle, but given the heavy tracking pressure, which is going to be about 90 grams for that type of tone arm, you're probably better off using a steel needle. Alright, I just put one of those extra loud needles in there and it's vibrating that tone arm like crazy. In fact, it's just really annoying if you want to know the truth. So I'm going to try one of these other needles that's in the needle cup and see how it does. Okay, that's a little better. Still getting some needle talk, but you know, you're going to get that regardless of what kind of needle you have in there. Alright, there's my repair work. A little bit neater than the way it was from the factory. Alright, I had the platter removed and we're greeted with a typical Alliance drive mechanism that was very popular in 78 players from the late 30s to uh, well into the 1950s. And it's going to need the works. Cleaning and lubrication of this spindle and then Technically, this automobile needs to be re-rubbered. Motor needs to be taken apart and cleaned and lubricated. The mounting grommets are turned to they've turned to powder and need to be replaced. But I won't bore you with all of the footage on that. You've seen me do it before, and it's exactly the same as it was last time. So we just get to work on this. Okay, I've already removed the spindle, cleaned it, lubricated it, used 91% 90, alcohol to clean it up, used this super lube multi-purpose synthetic grease with a little zoom spout mixed in to lubricate that, then I removed the idler wheel, and then removed the fan from the motor, and here's my layout to show me where everything goes that clip on the bottom, then that washer, that washer, that felt washer, the fan, the other washer, and finally the top retainer clip. And this particular motor has four bolts. I think this is the first one I've ever seen with four bolts. Now, the, about the only thing that warrants mentioning here is to make sure you don't lose any of the bolts, the spacers, or nothing like that. But before I tear into the motor, I need to take this top plate off and replace those mounting grommets. So I just went ahead and put the nuts on the bolts to keep the motor from falling apart while I'm working on this other here. And this is simply held in place by, what, three, screw, three screws that are accessible from the underside. Okay, ran into a little problem here, and this is why I keep junk on hand. This is one of the surviving grommets. The other two are turned to powder. And then on top of the grommet you had these brass. Well the only grommets I had on hand were the rubber cone shaped grommets and those were too tall to use with these kind of spacers so I had a junk mechanism out of a record player that I scrapped and I took the more standard spacers and washers out of that and matched them up with these grommets and it seems like it fits okay. I just hope everything lines up when we put the motor back in. Now we'll take the motor apart and clean it and lubricate it and that'll be that. Okay, we have everything back together and it looks like the idler wheel lines up okay on the motor shaft. Technically it needs to be re-rubbered but I'm not worried about that right now. All we have to do now is clean the inner rim of the platter and put it back on and it should be good to go. Okay, we're back together and I had to tighten down the cartridge screws. That helped some of the chattering some. And it plays pretty good, but I still think it could be a little bit better. And just because this cartridge has output, that doesn't mean that it's entirely healthy and working as good as it did when it was brand new. You know, there's rubber parts inside that could have deteriorated and with this tone arm being a heavy tracker, it's way too heavy for even a modern ceramic cartridge and there's no provisions for a counterweight or a counterbalance spring, so the only option would be to have this cartridge rebuilt and that's about 60 bucks. 
or change the tone arm out to something newer that has a counterbalance spring on it and install a more modern cartridge in it but given the rather scarcity and the rarity of this machine it's probably best just to leave it just like it is and as far as the safety factor of this machine maybe one day I'll do a safety mod on it I don't know but right now I'm not if this was something that I was planning on releasing to someone or something I was fixing for someone, I would not let it out of here with a hot tone arm on it. But seeing as how I'm probably just going to hang on to it, it's really no big deal, especially since I'm not going to use it that, that much, if at all. You know, years ago it wouldn't be a problem selling something like this, but in today's crazy, lunatic, mixed up, no common sense, so happy world, it's just, it's just too much liability involved. And besides, I wouldn't want uh, somebody getting killed on my conscience when it happened with something that I let them have, so, you know, that's just the way it is. And as far as ceramic cartridges, the only thing currently made that would come close to even working in this tone arm would be a Fansteel P51-3. I think 10 grams is the maximum recommended pressure for it, but that cartridge has very little vertical compliance. And one time I did stick one in one of these types of tone arms on a crusty record player that I resurrected, and it, it played, but the tracking pressure was so much that you know, you could see it cutting through the record grooves, and it just didn't sound that well. So, like I said, the only option for this to be any better is to have the cartridge rebuilt. And even at that, I don't know how much better it would be. thing is a bit distorted and you know, that can very well be because of the rubber inside the cartridge you shot. I mean let's face it I'm surprised the crystal element even still has any out. And Glenn Miller record can't let this one play too long because I know it'll get flagged for copyright. Here's one of the ultra loud needles. And I think it may be doing a little bit better since I tighten this cartridge down, it's not chattering as much. That's too much. But yeah, that's about all I've got for this thing for right now, and the battery's about dead. So with that, I'll sign off, and more to come later. Now that one's chattering pretty good with this ultra-loud needle. Oh, and one more concluding thought about playing records with these heavy 90-pound tone arms. I wouldn't advise playing post-World War II 78s, particularly those that are pressed on some sort of plastic material, those, will, those were mainly meant for the later, lighter tracking pickup, say 30 grams and under, and something like this would shred one of those later 78s pretty quickly, and also those records are often cut a lot hotter than the older records, which means the needle is going to be vibrating more in the grooves, which means more groove damage is going to take place, but these older shellac records up to World War II, then you're probably pretty safe with them. But even at that, I probably still wouldn't play pristine records that you wanted to preserve on something like this. We gotta be there. America is bouncing her alarm. We gotta have our we gotta have on, on, for the love of America, this thing in the fun. Whatever they fire, we gotta retire.
language. 